by 1990, no Australian child will be living in poverty. Well, look, on the current account today, we've got quite a nice little JK. My government has decided to proceed immediately towards nomination of the wet tropics of North East Queensland to the World Heritage List. Well, this is the one that brings home the bacon. This is the budget that pulls the whole game together from 1983 onwards. If people had asked uh, at the beginning of our period of government, who was the least likely to become a uh, raging greenie. I guess uh, Graham would have been fairly high up in the, in the stakes. Graham's always been a zealous fellow, zealous in the best sense of the word, keen to do good works, good things, and I think he saw an opportunity there, and uh, he had uh, the support of the Prime Minister, and he also had the support of the Treasurer. It was a a very happy mixture of good politics with what was right. It was good politics at the time, obviously, and I played it for all that it was worth. Graham Richardson discovered the environment as a backroom number cruncher even before he became a minister. The battle fought out in the forests between greenies and loggers was reflected inside the cabinet. Colleagues who favoured development saw Richardson as a cynical manipulator of the green vote while Richardson saw himself as a genuine convert to the Green cause. I went up into the forest with Bob Brown and uh, a couple of his colleagues and we had a little picnic lunch on the shores of Lake Sydney, which is one of those very small but stunning mountain lakes in Tassie. And uh, I was impressed by their arguments um, but also I was impressed by them because they were so genuine. I never felt that Graham was terribly comfortable uh, in the environment and the bush uh, as opposed to talking about it in Canberra. Uh, and I can remember vividly a helicopter trip we did around the area of the Franklin with Bob Brown and we landed at the old dam construction site and uh, Bob was terribly excited about taking us into the bush to show us this uh, thousand-year-old uh, hue and pine tree that had been damaged by the construction workers as an act of vandalism before they left. Uh, and to get there, we had to uh, uh, plummet through 50 or 60 metres of very dense bush and uh, through mud and so on. And uh, Graham was desperately uncomfortable in that situation. He was, he was deeply concerned that his Reeboks were going to get dirty and that. Uh, he may be attacked by leeches, and uh, he was very happy to get back in the helicopter. I took the view that um, here was a, an opportunity to uh, do something good, which was pretty rare for me. So uh, there on the shores of Lake Sydney, as I sucked a soggy sandwich, I decided that uh, these people had a lot to offer and that I'd... Uh, endeavour to become their champion for whatever that was going to be worth. So it all happened. The electorate at large was becoming more environmentally conscious uh, and uh, to, a, to a political um, opportunist, um, this meant votes. And this could be, this could be targeted and, and implemented. Richardson's first target was the area of greatest concern to the environment movement, the rainforest of far north Queensland. Or could refuse to confront the state government over its decision to build a road through pristine wilderness. It was 1987, an election year. Richardson, still a backbencher, seized the opportunity to grab the Green vote. The first thing I did in a concrete sense was really push Hawke over the uh, northern rainforests. And uh, that required a bit of pushing because at the time I think the government were prepared not to heritage list very much of it at all. And uh, I really pushed for something big on that. 
Bob Hawke took Richardson's advice and tied up the Green vote one day after calling an election, the 11th of July, 1987. My government has decided to proceed immediately towards nomination of the wet tropics of North East Queensland to the World Heritage List. And this area includes the magnificent Daintree Forest. The Prime Minister had the Green vote in his pocket and the opposition on the run because of an extraordinary campaign to get ageing Queensland Premier Joe Bielke-Peterson to Canberra. The killer blow for opposition leader John Howard, though, was delivered by Paul Keating. I was responsible for breaking up John Howard's Box Hill tax policy speech, his policy launch, which left him in fiscal tatters at a critical time in the nation's economic history and therefore left him wounded and couldn't win the poll. Today's admission of a $540 million mistake in a tax package that took two years to draw up must have been a painful one. It was Keating who made this a real winner in the 1987 election to the extent that it dented the entire Liberal campaign and, and its leader. Uh, Keating played a, uh, a much under-recognised role in the 1987 campaign. And as I said, he, he contributed more to the eventual Labor vote than did the uh, albeit popular Bob Hawke. Hawke the populist decided on the Opera House for his campaign launch. It was lavish and theatrical, especially because of the way he had to make his entrance. They were building uh, roadworks in and out of the Opera House. And there was quite a security risk when you spoke with the Federal Police about Hawke going to a building where there's only one way in and one way out. So I said, well, that's simple. We'll put him on the barge and get him across. Hawke, who craved something no other Labor Prime Minister had ever achieved, three terms in government, was ferried across Sydney Harbour in the barge that was normally reserved for royalty. Many of Labor's traditional supporters were affronted. I thought you were for the workers, Bob. And it turned out to be one of the great disasters I've ever thought of, from this very simple thing of trying to get a Prime Minister safely in and out of a building became a major production. It, uh, yes, was not uh, exactly the right image, but that's how it happened, purely by mistake. The presidential-style launch contained an initiative that even opponents of the government have declared one of the great social reforms of the decade. My uh, government will establish a new program of family help. But the significance of the family allowance supplement was lost as Hawke's announcement was mercilessly lampooned. Mr Hawke, you said that by 1990, no child would be living in poverty. Uh, no, that was a misquote. Uh, misquote. What I actually said was uh, that no child would live in probably. Uh, no, not probably. Uh, uh, properly. Probably? Uh, no, not, no, not properly. Uh, what I actually said was uh, that no child would live on property. On property. That's what I meant. And, uh, and we're doing that. Uh, have a look at the interest rates. They're through the roof, mate. No child shall live in poverty. That uh, went through very, a great number of versions. And it's a wonderful case study of how speeches are written. Here's Hawke got lumbered with having made this ridiculous promise, when in fact I think the first time he really ever read it was when he delivered it that night. It started off as being a, a very broad and general commitment that a prime aim of the next Labor government would be to make sure that children didn't live in poverty, a very noble and necessary aspiration of government. As each successive draft went on, the words got sharpened and sharpened and sharpened. By 1990, no Australian child will be living in poverty. <laughs> of course, some of the critics, uh, for a long time after that, just uh, threw this up continuously at me. No child will live in poverty. Well, I just had to wear that cross. But it hurt me and, hurt, and has continued to hurt me very deeply because all those in the welfare industry, in the welfare organisations, 
have said, it's on a matter of record, that this is arguably the greatest single decision that's been made in the history of the federal government. But on these figures, the ALP will win with a reduced majority. Bob Hawke won his historic third term, but Labor's heartland rebelled. The government picked up marginal seats where the Green vote was important, but its support in safe seats plummeted. The government ended up owing the environment movement plenty. Uh, quite uh, very late at night on the, uh, on the night of the 1987 election, uh, the phone rang and uh, uh, Bob Hawke uh, came on the line and uh, uh, thanked uh, me and the, uh, and the environment movement for being involved in the uh, election campaign and contributing to its outcome and uh, simply expressed the, the view that he looked forward to working closely with us in the next term of government and that the environment would be an important issue. At the caucus meeting that followed, Bob said he wanted to thank his ministers for their role. Ministers, I got no mention. Now, I didn't need a mention, but I was entitled to one. And one of my colleagues, Kim Beasley, said to me after the meeting, you're very shabbily treated there, you should have been, your role should have been referred to. I mean, the strategy of this election and its prosecution was as much yours as anybody's. So I did feel, Bob always says that envy is not one of his traits. That is not true. That is absolutely not true. Keating believed that back in 1980, Bob Hawke had secretly promised that should he become Prime Minister, he would serve only two terms. The 1987 victory marked the beginning of a third term. Was the 87 election my, to be my last election as Treasurer? Um, probably, yes, I thought it probably was my last election as Treasurer. Probably. Not certain, but probably. He believed then that the time had come that Bob should give him a go. In fact, he believed that he had an agreement that Bob, during that period of the term of the parliament, would stand aside. And he, he saw this as... So all these events were running themselves together. and He was beginning to see this as a time when it would be a leadership transition. The two, the two terms thing had run its sort of course and that maybe it was my turn, that I'd more than pulled my weight in the government, particularly from 84 onwards. Well, in 83 is with the float, but, you know, in other respects from 84. And that, um, uh, that it was a, a, an issue around and about. It was, just, it was discussed in a sort of subterranean kind of way. While Keating pondered his future, Hawke rewarded one of the other architects of the 87 victory, Senator Graham Richardson. Promoted virtually straight from the backbench to the Cabinet, he was now legitimately Environment Minister. I really wanted it, because I knew that it was, uh, there was so much to do, and uh, it excited me. It was, the, it was the main area of interest in my life at the time, you know, quite apart from the politics of it, and quite apart from the people who've, uh, who've announced that I was never serious about it or whatever, it was the only area of policy at the time in which I had an abiding interest. I think Graham Richardson's uh, influence on the Prime Minister was perhaps the greatest uh, con contributing factor to the environmental outcomes that were achieved. Uh, he's the only minister that I've encountered who could ring Hawk uh, and uh, organise a meeting with him at five minutes' notice. He was the only minister that I dealt with uh, who, uh, fre uh, who Hawke frequently rang. It would be very foolish of any uh, leader or person in a, in a leadership position at that time not to have taken him seriously. And uh, my personal relations were good, so he always could come and talk with me and, and did. Uh, I think uh, we were a very good team uh, in a very important period. Richardson's first big battle in Cabinet was over Tasmania's forests. Should they be logged or not? 
Just before the 1987 election, an inquiry was set up to find out. The environment movement was able to stack the inquiry, or so it thought. Every name that came up uh, that the environment movement didn't approve, and believe me, you had only had to have uh, cut down a sapling in your boyhood to have been vetoed, uh, that's exactly what they did. So we went through this ludicrous situation of, in a sense, of an independent inquiry where every single person who went on that inquiry had to be approved by the environment movement. And so they, in a sense, handpicked the committee, the committee of inquiry. The committee, headed by the Supreme Court judge Michael Helsham, stunned everybody and outraged environmentalists by coming up with the wrong result. Most of the forest, he said, could be logged. The government was faced with a dilemma that would deeply divide it. It came down saying the wrong thing and we had to knock it over, which was not a very palatable thing for the government to do. And uh, we had a, a cabinet meeting that went for days on that, that question, days. I, wearing an industry hat, uh, was on the opposite side from Graham Richardson and others uh, because it seems to me the worst thing you can do for industries is to uh, set up a process of inquiry and then not accept their decision. It developed into very much a them and us debate amongst bomb throwers, you know. We had a very tough debate. It was opportunistic. If one was to adopt a more principled or consider principle, which is probably something that doesn't bother Graham very much, but a Labor government knowingly put out of work blue-collar workers in Tasmania, poorly educated blue-collar workers in an area where the unemployment rate was already 24%. A Labor government knowingly put extra people out of work in that area at the behest of middle-class trendoids from the eastern suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne. That is something which I believe a Labor government ought to be ashamed of. Graham's a very colourful figure. Graham presents uh, sometimes like a uh, Guy Fawkes display or sometimes like the most laconic, phlegmatic, outback bushy that there could be. And we were, we were in here a long time, bound together in this sort of dance around the environment and development debate. And I, I think he went through all of the uh, personalities and personas that he has and uh, all of the uh, styles of argument that he's good at. It, uh, it just went on and on and on. It seemed like forever. But Billy, the only reason it went on was, was Hawke. I mean, it, if he was just declaring himself, I wouldn't have to answer anything. And so uh, I'd have much preferred that. But the development ministers feared the debate was a charade, that Hawke and Keating had already been conscripted to the Richardson bandwagon do the best we can, but obviously in the outcome we won't satisfy everybody. But as I say, say la vie. You had uh, a whole cabinet that had to be talked to. And there was a lot of pressure being applied to, to cabinet ministers. Hawke didn't apply any. It should be noted that Hawke didn't ring anyone up and say, put your hand up. It was all left to me. It should also be remembered that he came in at the very end of that debate. My ally... Early on, loud and strong was Keating. Not remembered by many, but the cabinet minutes will show it. The first heavy to come in on my side and go for it was Keating. Now, some of the trees were very old there and are reaching a point where they were going to die naturally after so many hundred years. And there was an argument, look, log them now, they'll go anyway. But log which ones? So I came down, if you like, on the conservative side of that argument that was to preserve them. Because they are, I think, part of the world heritage. Effectively, a decision had been made by a cabal or less in the Prime Minister's office, which, of course, was part of the, of the, uh, the process of decadence, of the disregard of due process and all that sort of thing. The decision effectively had been made. Hawke was on Richardson's side. He was always going to be somewhat sympathetic if I brought it to him, because we were, we were pretty close, and rightly so. I had done a lot for him, and uh, 
you know, I don't think I was ever going to be dismissed out of hand. So at least I, I was able to get, get issues on the table and have him treat them seriously, whereas he mightn't have if I hadn't been the one doing it. Peter Cook had no such support, not even from his senior minister, John Kerrin. Cook used to argue the case forcefully, I believe competently, and put what I regard as the proper views for a Labor minister to a Labor government. He was let down, almost invariably, by Kerrin, who was the senior minister, ought to come in heavily behind him. I think probably because Kerrin had decided, oh, well, Richardson's got Hawke on his side, so what's the use? I still think he should have argued and should have got angry. Well, John Kerrin said to me uh, early on that you won't win this and uh, it's not worth going in and, and arguing for it. And I thought that in John's laconic style, he didn't really mean it, but he was preparing me mentally for a letdown. But I was a bit surprised that when we got into the Cabinet, you know, shortly after the battle was joined, John got up and left. And uh, he did come back and make some, uh, some noises of support and then left again. And I felt, to some extent, on my own. Well, Peter was a far better negotiator than I was. And I when I realised how policy was going to be followed, I believe that um, Peter Cook was well placed to, to dealing with the ongoing uh, dealing, as it were. Graham Richardson had achieved the seemingly impossible the wholesale public abandonment of a government report. With the decision, I don't think that anyone should look at cabinet decisions of this kind as, uh, as victories or losses for any uh, individuals. It's the issues that are important. Virtually all of the area was nominated for world heritage. The economic ministers believed the government had been hijacked by the Greens. The question of uh, environmental policy in the year government was a very long-standing debate it was characterised by a series of decisions which amounted, in my view, to sort of chronic ad hocery. There never seemed to me to be a consistent and viable policy position on issues which are tremendously important. Uh, we were sort of uh, interfering, uttering threats, making promises, making financial commitments, all these things in a very... Uh, messy way in my view, messy way for a federal government to behave and that's indulgent in, in my terms. It was a lot of crap. The, look, I mean the criticism was that we didn't have some grand uh, strategy. The truth being of course the development ministers were never going to let you have one. It was a great criticism for them to make because they wouldn't let you have one on the one hand and on the other hand they could criticise you for not having one. So. I was in a lose-lose and, uh, and was often losing ground because of it. I mean, I was always getting pilloried over that. I do know that he was able to achieve a number of very, very successful outcomes, which, uh, as an environmentalist, we have to be, you know, I have to be very grateful for. But uh, at, at the end of it, um, he wasn't about uh, environmentalism or instilling that in his Cabinet colleagues. Uh, bringing them all together towards a, a new understanding of how we ought to be um, interrelating the economy and the environment. He was about knocking people down and dragging them out. That was how uh, decisions were taken in that period. The environment did very well out of the Hawke government. Its supporters delivered votes and a pragmatic government responded. The same pragmatism worked savagely against another group of Australians, the nation's Aborigines. And he was supposed to be our great friend. He's told us over the years he was our great friend. He was going to do this for us and do that for us. But then we look at his track record, Hawke. He's done nothing for us. He's led us into the swamps of disillusionment. The disillusionment went back to the 1984 election campaign. Hawke dumped a land rights principle 
that Aboriginal people should have a veto over mining on their land. It was a retreat in the face of pressure from the Western Australian Labor government backed by the mining industry. Do you know that as a Western Australian you're a part owner of your state's mineral resources, but very soon your right of ownership could come under threat? Through Aboriginal land claims, your right of access to up to 50% of Western Australia could be taken away. The power of veto could also prevent mineral exploration and deny your right to benefit from the royalty payments. The mining industry believes that no Western Australian should be made an intruder in their own state, because land rights should always be equal rights. I would characterise it as one of the most despicable political exercises. It's been my misfortune to witness in Australia. It was saying things about Aboriginal people, their hopes and their aspirations, where the only equivalent I could think about would be the sort of Nazi race propaganda which was directed against the Jews. It was a disgrace to the mining industry. We got enormous pressure from the West Australian government. And Berkey was a mate, you know. He was, he was up, in the, up there with Alan Bond and other you know, luminaries, people of great standing in the community. Um, known for their policy position and concern for the rest of the human race. And that big money in WA and so on was you know, all part and parcel of the, of the culture of that period. And it certainly affected that issue. Premier Brian Burke had raised more than $1 million from business friends for Labor coffers. Land rights would have jeopardised that flow of funds. I think what it would have meant was that in some of the discussions that Brian Burke was having uh, with some of my cabinet colleagues uh, was that he would have had a lot more leverage than I expected he would have. I think the thing that is clear to us now, which wasn't clear then, was the extent to which the Western Australian government and Burke in particular and those associated with him were adept at gathering contributions to the Labor Party. I think that's quite a significant matter. Now, I'm not putting that forward in any sense of um, anything untoward or unnecessary influence, but political parties of all persuasions don't ignore uh, those that provide the lifeblood uh, of running their parties. By the bicentenary year of 1988, the cherished objective of national land rights had been abandoned. Hawke tried to defuse Aboriginal anger at a ceremony at Barunga in the Northern Territory, where he promised a treaty. There shall be a treaty negotiated between... ..between the Aboriginal people and the government on behalf of all the people of Australia. I did feel that the Barunga statement was really something significant, but then I had my misgivings about it all. I thought, well, it's too good, you know? And Hawk was there, Hand was there. If this is what's going to happen, then Aboriginal people have got nothing to fear in this country. The political process will bring them justice, you know? Bring us justice. Things will happen. But it turned out to be, you know, like snow on the desert sands. Where have they gone? Where's Hawk gone? Where's Hand gone? And the Barunga Statement, we were sold out on that after it was pro proclaimed and was just, in fact, window dressing for that year to make everything look good. It's important to, to understand uh, what I said there, uh, and if I may just actually uh, refer to what I said in my speech. In the longer term, I hope that the government will be able to make it possible for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians to reach a proper and lasting reconciliation through a compact or treaty I've never been hung up about the precise word we use to describe this. What is important is the process. Barunga lived emotionally, uncomfortably with Hawke until the end. His final act on his last day as Prime Minister was the unveiling of the Barunga Statement in Parliament House. It was a moment for reflection. Aboriginal policy was his greatest failure in office. In a sense, I look to you, my Aboriginal friends, asking you to say, yes, uh, you've done well, but also please understand uh, the sense of disappointment, in a way, that I have 
that uh, more could not have been done. I thought to myself, what a sad scene for Aboriginal Affairs. Here's the Prime Minister crying over what he should have done or could have done in Aboriginal Affairs, and he didn't do it. It was only his fault. He was a Prime Minister. Who else could be in the Prime Minister that had all the power available to them to do the things they wanted to do in Aboriginal Affairs, was crying now like a baby because he had these, missed those opportunities, which were available to him. Nobody stopped him. You know, it's only convenient politics on his part that stopped him doing the things he should have done. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind that given the popularity of the Prime Minister, his communication skills, his capacity to put arguments that were real furfies, like land rights means you'll lose your backyard or you can't go onto land. I mean, this was just rubbish. The authority of the Prime Minister putting those things to bed would have been extremely helpful. Now, we proposed that on a number of occasions, but it never happened. And I think it never happened because despite what Holding thought and on reflection, what I thought, I think Hawke really was never going to do, to take the big leap. Were their interests served, going to be best served by a unilateral imposition of a, a federal land rights legislative program, uh, which would have created political and social mayhem uh, and the possible defeats of Labor governments, which would have done and were committed to doing much more for Aboriginal people than the Conservative governments. Defeat of Labor, bringing in of governments that had no sympathy with them at all. I can recall um, uh, sp spending the weekend uh, at Clyde's house, um, the weekend after Clyde was sworn in as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. And uh, he decided from moment one that national land rights was going to be the goal and he pursued it. Uh, aggressively for about three years and I can still remember having these intense conversations with him that weekend and not wanting to be a wet blanket but I always personally thought that it was doomed to fail. I honestly didn't think it would ever be achieved and uh, frankly I don't think it ever will be achieved. <laughs> The bicentenary was a harsh reminder to Australia's Aborigines that their struggle for justice was 200 years old. For the nation's MPs, on the other hand, it was an occasion to indulge themselves in the luxury of a new $1 billion Parliament House. Prime Minister and his wife have greeted Her Majesty. This is very much a grand entrance into the new Parliament House of Australia. Well, I was uh, in the old Parliament House for some time. Uh, it was a terrible place in which to work. But, but I must say that it was an intimate place. Then we, then we made the move uh, to a, uh, a big building, some people say a magnificent building, uh, it's very large and you really have no natural interface with the public at all. It used to be said of the church in medieval times that it always built its churches on the hill to be closer to God. And uh, I'm not sure that we're closer to God. Certainly that building is further from the people. The first day in the new house was budget day. 
Keating saw it as his greatest moment. He had achieved Australia's biggest ever budget surplus. Madam Speaker, tonight I can report to the people of Australia that the nation is successfully emerging from its most severe economic crisis in a generation. Unquestionably, a dramatically better state of affairs now exists than when I warned in 1986 of the threat of Australia degenerating to the status of a banana republic. The Australian people can be proud that they have responded to economic adversity in a manner which the critics claimed was impossible. Well, looking back uh, on the 1988 budget, of course, uh, one associates uh, Paul and Pigs again. Uh, was This one was the uh, um, uh, budget that was going to bring home the bacon. And he was very proud of it and uh, euphoric. Questions first or a bit of an overview? Overview. Overview? Well, well this is the one that brings home the bacon. Uh, this is the... Uh, this is the budget that pulls the whole game together from 1983 onwards. The 1988 budget was, was terribly important to Paul because he thought it might be his last in politics. He thought this budget was where it all came together, almost as a last will and testament. Keating thought the Prime Ministerial Lodge would soon be his. He saw the 1988 budget as the prelude to him taking over as leader. Hawke's two terms were up point Keating had already made to him. So I said, you know, I, mean, I, I think I can do it and I'd be happy to do it, but if you feel you want to go on, and you're sort of determined to go on, well, let's go on and see where it, where it takes us. Um, but I said, but you've got to want to go on. It's no good half going on. You've got to want to go on. Now, I, I tested him out a bit on that over the course of that year. I think he thought, well, here was what Labor had had two terms, uh, not to... He hadn't expected us, or he hadn't been too confident about us winning in 1987. He was even less confident about a third term and he wanted a bit of the action. Paul and I have known each other for a long while. We used to share a room and, and it was a unusual conversation in the sense he, he came into my office and said uh, Bob Hawke has refused to step down for me and he promised me that he would and I you know I'm upset about that I said I I find that surprising I didn't know you'd ever had a discussion about him stepping down yes he said and I went round to see the Prime Minister and said, I've had a very surprising visit from Paul. I understand you were going to step down from him. No, he said, I'm never going to step down from him. Now, that's not right. I didn't bother to pursue it. It looked as though it was a conversation that shouldn't be pursued anyway. Hawke, in the meantime, was being advised that he should dump Keating, that the pressure over leadership had gone on too long, that perhaps Keating should be forced out. There were any number of people prepared to say to Hawke that... Uh, that he was the architect of his own success. It was inevitable that at some stage the Keating challenge was going to happen, that Hawke was going to be damaged in some way by having this, this powerful figure there behind him. Uh, so political advice was given to Hawke that it would be in his best interest if Keating could be persuaded to move on uh, and that he would go into the next election as a uh, clear, unchallenged leader. With this political advice in mind, Hawke went on the 7.30 report. How much of a setback for the government would it be if Paul Keating's patience ran out? And he said, I want to go and do something else now. We would miss him. Uh, he has been an outstanding treasurer, not just by Australian standards, but by international standards. Um, and we would miss him. Is there any danger of it happening, do you think? I don't think there's a danger. I suppose you've got to say it's a possibility. Um, um, I certainly hope and I expect that Paul will, will stay. Now, I, I don't discount that you know, he could go. I certainly don't want him to, I want him to stay, I think he will, but being hypothetical about it, if he were to go, uh, there are people of very considerable talent in the, in the ministry and the position would be filled. Hawke's words created a sensation. The Prime Minister was interpreted as saying his Treasurer was dispensable. Keating immediately tackled Hawke. I mean, there wasn't a skerrick of appreciation in him in that remark. And I responded, because what it meant was, what he was saying to me was, 
the partnership's over. I mean, how do you expect me to react? To say, oh, thanks very much, Bob. I mean, I worked like that. I said, listen, Bob, you've always had people in your life who you had as handmaidens to do your work for you and you cast aside when it suited you, in the ACTU and other things. I am not such a person. So this government's got two leaders within it and I'm the other one and you don't treat me like that. I'd explained to him that he was being quite stupid and that I thought he'd come to see it differently because it just seemed to me that it was... Uh, that he was being emotionally immature. I mean, he was a treasurer, the engine of the government, and I have to say that. I mean, Hawke was the captain of the ship, but Keating, and everyone knew it, was, was, the, was the chief engineer. And uh, being locked up in that cabinet room for week after debilitating week, for hours at a time, with ministers putting the budget together, having, having got a budget that, that, that was going to be well received, and then to have it blown out of the water uh, 24 hours after it was delivered by this statement, which fundamentally was a statement saying, well, as far as I'm concerned, he can piss off. And I mean, that's, that's really what Hawke said. It was unforgivable. Then it became clear that perhaps Bob's performance would be a catalyst for something to change, for the leadership to change. Paul Keating wanted to call on a leadership challenge. He attempted to swing his New South Wales right-wing colleagues over to his cause. They would be fundamental in any ballot. But his old mates could not be persuaded. While it's true to say that Paul was, uh, was very upset by the indispensable remarks, and while um, he did his share of ranting and raving, he didn't have much support. And so, really, I was saying to Hawkey, well, you're silly to have made the remark because there's not going to be any problem for you. you know, if he runs, he gets 10 votes, who cares? And because he's smart enough to know he's going to get 10 votes, at the end of the day, he won't run. So what are we worried about? Simple as that. Instead of switching support from Hawke, Richardson got the Prime Minister to go back on television and try to calm things down. It's not accurate to talk about a rift. The accurate thing is this, Ray. Paul Keating has been in politics a long time, made an enormous contribution, and he has a totally legitimate ambition to succeed me as Prime Minister. And perhaps in, in retrospect, when you look back on that initial conversation that Keating had with Hawke, uh, when he was so upset with what uh, Hawke had said on the 7.30 report, perhaps Hawke should then have sat down with him and levelled with him and said that, look, perhaps in the interest of the party, this is the best approach. Um, uh, and that you do think about your position, but that wasn't Hawke's style. And so he chose to uh, he chose to try and compromise what he had said and then uh, go on another program and try and straighten it out. Uh, he obviously wasn't ready for a confrontation at that point. But Keating remained angry. We're sitting at the coffee table, Tom Mockridge, Seamus Dawes and myself, and Paul's raging up and down the carpet, just raging. You know, that rotten bastard, you know... Da, 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 and we're sitting... <laughs> Thing, you know, and the phone rings. Paul goes round behind his desk. No, oh, I don't want to take any bloody phone calls. So secretary comes in and says, oh, it's Graham Richardson. OK, right, I'll take the call. So Richardson was ringing up to say, look, mate, look what I've done for you. I've got Bob on television to calm everything down. So aren't we all happy? And, of course, we weren't all happy. So he gets on the phone. And what was happening was Graham was ringing up, basically to say, look, you've got to make the peace, mate. How you, you know, you're... And there's this sort of, uh, no. I said, no, stuff him. Yeah. He didn't, I mean, he didn't actually say stuff him, but he said something far more direct than that, which I'm not going to say on television. No, I went around and saw him this morning. I told him, it's all off. It's finished. He can get stuffed. I'm never going to work with him again. No, no, Graham, no, forget it. He's a little this, that. The other so and so, I mean, the, it was just a whole string of uh, fairly um, ripe language. And then there were about two or three minutes of this. And then right at the end of it, he stopped and he said, You're ringing from where? And he just hung the phone up. And we're all sitting at the coffee till the three of us looking at him, and he said, That stupid bastard was ringing me from a car phone.
I remember at the time saying, just very lightheartedly, gee, that would be amazing if anyone heard that. And I thought, oh, my God. And I can remember I left the office and I went looking for Gareth Evans, who was the Minister for Transport and Communications, and because I knew he would know, and he was in the chamber, on chamber duty. And I remember I went into the chamber and I, I said to Gareth, uh, I said, oh, Gareth, how secure are mobile phones in Canberra? And he said, not at all, mate, not at all. He said, why? And I told him, and he said, oh, my God. He said, it is, is it potentially embarrassing? I mean, t yeah, talk about, talk about uh, potentially embarrassing. And I, was, I remember saying to him, I said, oh, well, it depends. And he said, what do you mean? I said, oh, well, if they delete all the expletives, I said, the only thing will be left will be hello and goodbye. <laughs> and then, uh, not 24 hours later, Someone had picked the conversation up and um, a version of it was circulating. Jeff! Jeff! Ah, ah. Mind if I borrow your car phone? I just want to say a few words about Bob Hook. No worries. Use the special leadership line. It's fully automatic, it swears every tenth word and sends a printout to the newspapers. <laughs> Hawke was given a copy of the transcript on his way to Sydney for a Labor Party function. He rang Keating from the Speaker's office at the New South Wales Parliament House. And it was a very rare conversation involving Paul Keating because uh, the other party did all the talking. And it was quite extraordinary. I mean, the, the language that Hawke used there would have cleared the, the bar in the John Curtin Hotel uh, in Hawke's heyday. He, he was determined that this time Keating got it all. Well, it was simply... Uh appalling and stupid and needed to be sorted out and I spoke quite strongly about that and uh, made my view very clear um, and then went in and raised some considerable amount of money for the Labor Party. The party had been destabilised. The episode marked a turning point in how many of Hawke's colleagues saw his leadership. Doubts about his future became much more serious. I suppose that that which had been his strength, that is, um, the absence of any uh, sort of single-minded view about uh, what the government should be on about, whereas that had been a strength in the earlier period, I think it had started to become a weakness uh, during that period. There was a degree of disaffection uh, with aspects of Bob's leadership uh, there was a bit of momentum that uh, developed around Paul and it was really only that core group of uh, centre-left ministers that, that really were prepared to even think in terms of uh, a head-on confrontation, a leadership assault. Uh, the rest of us were anxious that Bob lift his game and as events turned out, I think uh, that was a justified concern. And I think it was coming to the point where we really had to decide uh, who we wanted to be our leader into not just the next election, but the, the one or two elections following uh, that. And um, I was pretty strongly of the view that uh, Keating really represented the kind of leadership we needed for the late 80s and to lead us into the 90s. John Dawkins confronted Hawke, demanding he step down. Do you regret asking the Prime Minister to resign, Mr Dawkins? Well, uh, as you know, I'm not uh, commenting on discussions I have with the Prime Minister. I have many discussions with the Prime Minister, and uh, both in the past and also in the future. Dawkins came to see me. Dawkins is a, uh, a complex character, uh, a bright person, capable of lateral thinking, in many respects politically very immature. Um, and uh, he came with his idea and uh, I told him that uh, it was uh, his thinking was falling on stony ground. I didn't mince any words. Uh, if anything, I was... I found him um, almost uh, in a kind of a... well, not quite a trance, but uh, he was uh, totally impervious to uh, the kinds of views that I was uh, putting. Keating was determined there should be a resolution to the leadership issue. He confronted Hawke yet again, 
This time, Keating demanded not only an agreement on the leadership, but that the agreement be witnessed. I didn't think I could trust Bob's word. Him having said he'd only stay a couple of parliaments and reneging. Now, I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't, at that stage, to be fair to him, tie him down to that. But to the spirit of it, I, he, gave, he gave me an indication and I expected the spirit of that to be observed. He uh, made uh, an observation which to me was beyond belief, and that is that if, he, if he, he thought that if he ever did become Prime Minister, he would also combine the position and role of Treasurer with it. And I just burst out laughing. I mean, it was just so unreal as to be quite preposterous, and it made one wonder, as I said to him, uh, whether he understood uh, you know, just what was involved in uh, being Prime Minister. Well, I mean, I, I thought that, uh, I mean, Chifley was Prime Minister and Treasurer. Um, most Premiers are Premiers and Treasurers. Uh, one takes responsibility for the overall direction of policy and has an assistant minister to actually carry the workload of it. I mean, it's possible to do. I still think today it's possible to do. Temperature ranges for the city 18 to 23, Liverpool 16 to 24, Richmond 10 to 25. At the moment in town, 21 degrees average. ABC News, it's 10 past six. to meet here at Kirribilli House, the Prime Minister's residence in Sydney, on November 25, 1988. It was one of the most extraordinary events in Australian history, a secret agreement before two witnesses that the Prime Minister would step down in favour of his Treasurer after the 1990 election. The witnesses were businessman Sir Peter Abels and union leader Bill Kelty. It was a Friday night at uh, Kirribilli House. It was starting to spit with rain, if I can recall correctly. Oh, <laughs> well, it was a funny little meeting, <clears throat> which occurred in this room. This room I'm being interviewed in now. And uh, it, didn't, it didn't last long. The uh, Kirribilli meeting uh, arose out of a situation where uh, Paul Keating was, was pressing uh, for some understanding about uh, the succession. And so, with reluctance, and considerable reluctance, I uh, agreed to the concept that was advanced. It was, uh, it was actually a very friendly meeting, and Bob and Paul expressed their points of view, and Peter and I had a cup of coffee, I think. It was the greatest contribution we made. It was nothing really more than the two of us being present, and I didn't even concentrate when they discussed some of their own issues, and it only took up an importance when one day, three years later, I came home from overseas and I read in the paper that I was on a very fatal meeting present, and that's how I saw that whole meeting. In the course of the, of the discussion, of course, there was a lot of uh, reference to uh, references to uh, Paul's unacceptability, uh, his unpopularity. And I said, well, look, I'm a bit handicapped where I am. Don't be too hard on me. I've had to carry a can for so much of these changes, uh, which has left you, Bob, free to look, you know, as prune, prune yourself as best you could. Um, but I said at the right time, I'll, I'll make the changes which suit me and my personality. But then he went on to say a funny thing. He said, now, look, I've got to tell you this. He said, um, there's a few things I must say to you. You've got to be, he said, you've got to be more respectful of the colleagues. You've got to be, uh, uh, you've got to be on time for the Cabinet meetings. If you're going to be a successful leader, you've got to have your, your people around you feeling that you don't treat them with contempt. Uh, and uh, the, that was just one example of, of the way in which I felt that people did have that impression. At the time I was saying, well, thank you for that advice, you know. 
I mean, it was, after all, saying he'd stand down in my favour, so I wasn't going to offend him or affront him, but I took those bon mots with a grain of salt. It was uh, coming from the very best of motives and uh, expressing a concern that not only I had, but was consistently put to me by others that uh, they felt that uh, Keating was contemptuous of them and that uh, their timetables, uh, their programs and so on were, were not important to him. Uh, he was the only one that mattered. I said to him, well, if you're not going to be Prime Minister because uh, you're late, then I've got no hope of keeping my job because I'm always late. So we make a great pair, we'll go, we'll go nowhere together. <laughs> when um, There wasn't much more said. That when we left, uh, Bill Killey said to me, I'd never until now understood what the qualifications for being Prime Minister are, that you'd never be late for Cabinet meetings. Now, don't you ever be late for Cabinet meetings. He was scolding me, you know, mockingly at the door. You know, we sort of chortled off into, the <laughs> into our respective cars. As night fell over Sydney in November 1988, Paul Keating felt he had good reason to smile. He believed he had a cast-iron agreement that Bob Hawke would hand him the Prime Ministership, and he was confident that the economy would turn around. He was wrong on both counts.